Okay, is everyone settled in? Ready for our first movie night? <laughs> well, since the theme of this retreat is the gift of happiness, we are going to spring off on our first movie of the retreat with the theme that I started off with today of, of the gift. And the best way we can come at opening to the gift of happiness is we cannot approach it from the I know mind. We cannot approach a gift or giving from what we already know. Because what we already know, what we've learned, we've learned from the ego. And the ego is blocking us from understanding the gift. So we really can first say we're clueless about the gift. The gift of happiness. Because we have to give it in order to receive it. But we have to learn how to give as God gives. God doesn't have strings attached. God, God didn't create Christ and say, now, you're going to owe me. I'll give you eternal life, but it's going to cost you something. You're going to have to pay me back. Like a loan, you know, in this world. You give it, but you got to pay something back. There's a price to pay. God doesn't have, you know, what price means. It's just, it's just unconditional love. That's what agape love is. It's just an unconditional gift. I love you and that's that. Nothing attached, no strings attached. And in human terms, that's what makes the relationships, love-hate relationships, how quickly the love, I love you forever, can turn into I want a divorce. <laughs> How quickly I love you forever can turn into, I don't ever want to see you again. Or I don't ever want to speak to you again. I never want to see your face again. From, I love you forever, and then it's turned quite vicious. <laughs> and, and then you could ask the question, was there ever love? <laughs> if it can turn into, I never want to see you again. That's not the way God loves. God doesn't create eternal life and then say, hmm, you messed up. I never want to see you again. It's just the way the ego operates, but not God. So our movie tonight is a great parable of a young man's journey of undoing pride, undoing arrogance, coming into humbleness and humility, which is coming towards the gift to learn what the gift really is, and coming into a place of service and wanting to be of help in a greater plan. And it's not like this movie is over, overt religious or spiritual uh, terminology, it's just going to be a young man starting to see for himself that it, it feels good to give. It feels good to pour your heart into giving. And that's really where joy and happiness can be found. So it's a beautiful parable of awakening. And it's also a beautiful movie because it uses a device where he, his grandfather uh, is, he's had his own struggles and issues, but he's about, he's very, very, very wealthy as the world would see it. He, he owns more than we can imagine. He is a, he owns so much, he's in control of so much in terms of planet Earth, and yet he's ready, he's passed, he's dying, he wants to pass on something to his grandson that is the title of the movie, The Ultimate Gift. He wants to give his grandson something that he'll experience in his heart and he'll carry with him forever. Not just give him a bunch of money. And so the way he's going to do it, the device, is before the grandfather dies, he makes a series of DVDs, of video messages, so he's going to do it from the grave. Pretty interesting idea. I'll leave this for you, but I'll lead you through a series 
of exercises or tasks that will take you, and the grandfather knows, into a place of humbleness, which is the, really the greatest gift. He wants to leave his grandson with something that will last forever, not something that is temporary or perishable. So, some of you know the actor James Garner, very, very famous actor. He's playing the grandpa, and he's going to use this device. And I think it is very applicable for all of us because as we go deeper in this journey, the ego will come in with many temptations to try to get into the old way of giving, which is reciprocity. I'll do this for you, if you'll do this for me. It's very much based on abundance and happiness being something that's on the timeline. And remember what I was sharing earlier today, that, that hatred is under this linear cosmos. Rage is under there. We're not going to find the gift in the device, the distracted device that was put there to shield us from the gift. You can never find the pearl of great wisdom in the distractive device. You actually have to turn your gaze inward, away from the distractive device. And that's what Jesus taught us, the kingdom of heaven is within. Like you have everything in, within your mind as, as you were created. And you have a small still voice, an intuitive voice that will guide you to this state of mind, that is the kingdom of heaven. It's not a place. It's not a location, and it can't be found through the images. It, the images can be pointers, and even a book, as helpful as A Course in Miracles, is a book that has a text, and a workbook, and a manual for teachers. It has over 1,200 pages in the English version, and it's much larger in, in other versions that there's more words, and yet, it's a collection of words that are designed to point you in the direction of the Kingdom of Heaven within. Are the words valuable in and of themselves? No. What he tells us in the Course are words, are symbols of symbols, twice removed from reality. So just trying to find the Kingdom of Heaven through the words won't work either. Just like we've used symbols in this world to try to find salvation, or redemption, or healing, and the symbols aren't going to do it. But the Spirit's use of the symbols is to get you to take a leaping off point within your mind. Just like meditation, people will sometimes work with a mantra in the East, or they'll work with breath work postures, you know, there's lots of techniques, transcendental meditation, there's uh, Yogananda had a system of Kriya Yoga, there's many different systems, even of meditation, but that's still the use of symbols to take you into a leaping off point that's beyond the symbols. It's never about, in the end, the postures or the breath. It's never about anything that's the technique. It's about just having the desire with all your heart to Go for it and practice and sink down deep beneath all these thoughts, this stream of thoughts. And the Course in Miracles is doing the same thing that ancient meditation techniques have, have advised and uh, except you might say a Course in Miracles is used for the most part, the workbook is open-eyed meditation. You're literally practicing with the images that you see. And Jesus will teach you that the thoughts that you think you think and the images that you think you see are actually the same. There is no inner and outer, but that's going to take a lot of mind training to see that there is no external world outside the mind. It's just a swirl of cloud patterns going on in the mind that's blocking the mind from the light. And those cloud patterns are projected by the ego and they seem to take three-dimensional form but they aren't really three-dimensional at all. They're just blocks, they're like shadows. And as long as you're inside of those clouds, you can't, you can't see. Jesus will even use guided meditations in the workbook of A Course in Miracles, where he'll ask you to sink down 
beneath the clouds, and he'll even say, feel them on your cheeks. <laughs> you see, he's using very graphic imagery of sinking down beneath these clouds. Feel them on your cheeks. Clouds cannot stop you, he says. He's very strong, like keep coming, come sink deep within to the kingdom of heaven. You know, this is one of his guided meditations in the workbook. So he's going to use the same thing. This movie is a good starting off point for us because as long as we value the things of this world, then the light within will seem to be frightening. Why? Why is the light so frightening? It's the unknown. When we had amnesia and forgot about God, when we forgot about the light and had amnesia and we got into image making, instead of creating, creating as God creates in love and light, that was our original purpose, our, our gift from God to, uh, to be a creator. You've heard of co-creator with God? God gave us everything, including the ability to create like God, in spirit. Not in material, but just in spirit. So, as long as that's pushed out of awareness and we have, we'll say, an absolute and complete amnesia of that love and that light, which is what this world is. It's a complete amnesia. It's not a partial amnesia. The only way we can flip it back around and undo that mistake of amnesia is instead of forgetting God and believing in a world of images, we can forget the world of images <laughs> and come back to God. Put our full attention on reaching God. Our mind is that powerful. We can flip it on the ego. We flipped it once uh, away from God, we can flip it back. We always have that power. We can never turn our back on God, actually, and so we always have the power to come back. So, a good step in doing that is the step of coming into genuine service. We're not talking about some kind of egotistical service where you're doing a lot of things, trying to be helpful, using past associations, and with ego service there's still some desire for recognition. It's still like, see what I'm doing. Uh, even in, in the Middle East, uh, back in the days of Jesus, there were the rabbis that would go out and go out in public and they would paint their faces and they would pray. I was saying in the Bible, Jesus says, no, don't, don't pray as the high priest pray, like in this very public way, to try to impress. Look, like, Look at me, look how much I pray all day, look at my position, and this and this. He said, go to your closet, Jesus says in the Bible, and pray in secret. You see how that's the exact opposite of trying to pray and get attention to even praying. He said, no, go to your closet and pray in secret. It says right there in the red words that I was talking about <laughs> earlier. So that's a, that's a good indication. And that's what eternity would say, like, yeah, you're not making it back to eternity if you're trying to get famous as a famous prayer, <laughs> or a famous priest, you know, it's not going to work. So this movie is, is amazing. Michael, this was one of your first movies that you saw. You said it was extremely impactful. So we're talking... Yeah. It was your first devotional, and, and again, to give a little background on Michael, Michael was here living in Australia, very successful, CEO of a company that was a construction company that built houses. So, just like with Francis, Francis was, had her own business, financial management, you know, successful as the world would judge it, and then got inspired that there has to be a better way. There was a disillusionment, always with Michael, he was searching searching, there's got to be more, there's got to be something else. And then this movie was one of the first ones that you've seen, the first one down here that was during a retreat that just had a huge impact. Yeah, that was it, it was just a, it was only a few weeks after I went to my first retreat with Jason and Kirsten and said, well this, I was just inextricably drawn, just felt I just needed to 
move in this direction. I didn't even know what that meant, but very quickly I seemed to have moved on from a 19-year marriage and work was just so, I just couldn't do it anymore, really. And um, I went to this devotional and we had this, uh, this movie came on and I just, yeah, it really brought me undone, actually. I was in a mess for about three quarters of an hour after it, actually, just slobbering and tears and snot. And, and uh, it was just, it was just something, it wasn't even anything, one specific thing, because it's just such a great movie. It covers so many different areas. You know, there's like 10 gifts, I think, that come out of it. And there is the ultimate gift, if you like. Um, yeah, it was just the huge forgiveness. There seemed to be some symbolism about the Father and the Son, you know, the Heavenly Father and the Son just being reunited after the separation. And um, just the whole service thing, really. I really got the service, the, the way out of service, you know, that this guy, I could relate to his arrogance in a way. And it shocked me how arrogant I was actually from this movie. Uh, I thought I was a pretty nice guy, and I realised I'm, you know, I used to think of humour and sarcasm and things like that, and um, yeah, it was just, I think it was a, like a, a big bang for me because it was just so many different areas that uh, that got popped, it seemingly just like that, you know, from this movie. So it's just a very very helpful. <laughs> so it feels really beautiful to share it with you all and have it as one of our our first movies here. Uh, yeah, it was this one and Brother, Son, Sister Moon that completely brought me undone. So, yeah, and it's. I think it's. It's also just a. It's an excellent teaching device to truly teach what we would learn and and send us in the right direction. In the sense that, that um, in this world, it's just a world of images that have been made as a veil to cover over the truth, the light of truth. But, but. Images, certain images can seem to take on magnified importance, which is exactly what the ego wants to do to keep you from recognizing who you are. If the ego can make the distractive device attractive, then you're not going to want to meditate. You're not going to want to pray. It's going to be go, go, go. Achieve, attain, own, possess, more, more, more. Uh, there's even a section in the later part of the text, which is become, called Beyond All Idols, where Jesus titles this section, the subsection of the chapter, Beyond All Idols, and then he opens up his first sentence of his first paragraph with, What is an idol? Do you think you know? <laughs> this is how Jesus opens the subsection. What is an idol? Do you think you know? Because some of us have heard that word before. You might remember even from, if anybody remembers anything about the Bible, you know, the, the commandments, you know, and hold no idols before the Lord thy God. Ooh, must be important if we're not supposed to hold on to them. Before the Lord thy God, it's like, whoa. Hold no graven images before the Lord thy God. It's not really talking about golden totem poles and statues, you know, that are worshipped in some cultures. It's talking about the entire cosmos, all the images of the cosmos are the graven images, because the ego made them all. And in that same section, Beyond All Idols, Jesus has an amazing sentence, which is only four words in a period, but to me, those <coughs> Four words and period really give you a true sense of the metaphysics of A Course in Miracles. Such a tiny little sentence placed in there with only four words and a period, but that can really help you out immensely. And the four words are, God knows not form, period. God knows not form, period. So if I want to know God, and God knows not form, put those together. In divine reasoning, you can just, your mind can go, whoa, God knows not form. God knows not words. The I am presence is prior to time. Before Abraham was, I am, is the way Jesus taught it in the Bible. 
Before history was, I am. Before time and space was, I am. God knows not form. So we can see that it's going to take a dedication in the mind, and we're not even going to reach God through the words, because God knows not words. <laughs> words are form. But the prayer of the heart, you know, that's it. Remember the Beatitudes? Remember the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Wow, little tiny little Beatitudes, but they've got the whole key to waking up to God. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. So we're going through a purification process, and we're learning to give the form that the ego made, the words and the images, over to the Holy Spirit. And we're learning to say, I don't know how to, how to get there, but you do. And that's why you're placed in my mind as the bridge back to eternity. You are the one that knows the way. This small, still voice, this intuition, if you will, that all of us have, is guiding us surely back to love and light, the kingdom of heaven, nirvana, call it whatever you want, perfection. We're surely being guided back. We're gu it is actually inevitable. Jesus says, inevitable is very fearful to the ego. Of course, the ego is out of business in the inevitable of love and light. And that's why the ego is doing everything it can to defend against this remembrance of love and light. And even though it's, it's a puff of nothingness, if you give your powerful mind over to this puff of nothingness, then what you have is is a clever puff of nothingness. <laughs> you see how suddenly it takes on an attribute of clever cleverness. And Jesus even says the ego is ingenious. You know, we tend to think of Einstein's mind as ingenious, but the ego is ingenious. And if we feed this puff of nothingness, it can turn into a very long, long, long journey, seemingly back to God spanning many seeming lifetimes, or a millennium of time and space, wandering in the darkness for a long, long, long time, just by feeding this puff of nothingness in our mind. In fact, in the Garden of Eden, and in the Bible, it talks about the fall, the fall of mankind in there. Uh, in Jesus' version in The Course in Miracles, there's no snake, there's uh, no Adam and Eve, there's no tree, <laughs> uh, there's nothing like that, there's no plants uh, in it. It's just, he has, now he's reduced the entire apparent separation to one sentence. Isn't that good for us? We can boil it down, now we've got past Genesis, now we're down to one sentence. Into eternity, where all is one, there crept a tiny mad idea at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. That's it. It's a new story. He's condensed the entire book of Genesis, which was so called the creation and the fall from grace, he's condensed it to one sentence. And I remember I was, I was sharing that one sentence one time with a group in Wisconsin. Into eternity where all is one, there crept a tiny mad idea at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. So I gave the idea and my friend Al, who's since passed away, he was in the audience and he went, crept, crept. <laughs> <laughs> All of his rage came out on that one word, crept. <laughs> he was furious. He was here's Jesus' new little story, just one little sentence. And the same rage that people feel when they're in Genesis, reading Genesis in the Bible, like, why would God put a tree like that <laughs> into paradise? That's a nasty tree to have in paradise. And why would God tempt Adam and Eve by saying, you can eat from all the fruits, but 
don't eat from this one tree. What happens when you tell children, don't, don't get into the cookie jar? Oh, I'm putting the candy up here on the top shelf so you can't have any. And I'm going away, but don't, don't eat from the candy jar. They've got ladders and, and chairs on top of chairs. They're going to get up. If you tell a child, don't do this, what will they try to do? They will try to do this. Why, you know, that's what m many people in Christianity even have said, you know, like, gosh, that's a heck of a thing to tell Adam and Eve. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, God would never do that. that. Even that is just symbolic. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the symbolic of duality. Don't give your mind over to duality, because God is love, God is oneness. Everything is pure oneness. So in The Course in Miracles, Jesus even corrects that. He said, God would never put you in such a position. Well, hallelujah, give it to me straight. Correct the Bible. There's only one that can really come out and forcefully, honestly, directly correct the Bible, and that's Jesus, who's transcended the Bible. <laughs> He's, he can make commentary on, on Genesis. I wouldn't recommend doing this until you are clear, because if you have a firestorm of people, you're what? You're, cor you're correcting Genesis, the first book of the Bible? You know, Jesus can do that. He's, in fact, in the first book of the Bible, it says that Adam fell asleep. If you go back to the Bible, it says Adam fell asleep. And nowhere in that Bible does it say that he woke up. So, with the Chorus we're going, Adam did wake up. It was Jesus. And you would expect the one who woke up to send word back. The good news, sin is not real. Good news, separation is not real. And more than that, here I'm going to give you a pathway to experience the good news that I discovered as well. You know, he's not going to, there's not a sense of leaving anybody behind. Ha ha ha, I made it and you didn't. You know, that's not the way love is. It's more like, come my brethren, my sisters, come and join me in the freedom. That's a way shower. That's what a way shower does. So again, with this movie, we'll sit back and enjoy it. I may pause it uh, if there's any commentary to come during the movie, but as Michael was saying, it's very powerful and it's, it's very delightful. And I think it, it offers a great mechanism for beginning to open your heart up to experience a true gift or the ultimate gift. Another thing that it, you know, when people talk about distractions in this world, they usually talk about, you know, money and sex and food. There's certain things that the ego just emphasizes so strongly that it's going to try to distract you from that be still and know that I'm God. It doesn't want you to get into be still and know that I'm God, because that it's over for the ego if you get into that. So it's going to just try to distract. Money the only reason money seems to be a, a strong distraction is because it's so exchangeable for, for other things. I mean, you can trade money, currency, for other things, for goods and services. So if the ego is the getting mechanism of the mind, you can see where money will be highly elevated for the ego, because it's going to use the money to get things for itself, to perpetuate itself to perpetuate its belief system. And so really the money in the Holy Spirit's eyes, or to Jesus, it's just neutral. It's just another neutral symbol that can be used in the awakening, as, as needed. But in this movie, we see that a very, very, very wealthy man has died. He is going to direct his, he's got a large family, and they want the money. He's died, they want the money, and he's going to direct them through a, through a series of DVD video messages. They're all going to be showing up like, come on, let's get to cut the chase, cut the check. <laughs> let's have some houses, money, you know, he's, he's a financial empire. They're wanting that. And so it's going to show us, in the context of all of that, uh, which there's jealousy and greed and infighting and 
all kind of bickering and typical things that go on when somebody dies in this world and leaves a big inheritance, then actually in the context of all of that, it's going to take us deeper into the ultimate gift, which has really nothing to do with the form of this world. It, it's coming back to that true giving, that spirit of giving and spirit of true generosity in the heart. I think that's what's, to me, what's so touching about this movie. In that context, it takes you and uses it as a teaching device to take you inward. Okay, everyone ready? The name of the movie, as Michael mentioned, is The Ultimate Gift, starring James Garner. His first gift, the gift of work. And, and why is work a gift? Because when you've fallen asleep and forgotten your source and your very nature, and you find yourself in a dream of lack, surprise, surprise, that's what the ego is, the belief in lack, then you will have to get yourself out of what Jesus calls an impossible situation. And this world is indeed an impossible situation. It, it's so impossible that it could never happen in reality. It's a hallucination of lack. It's a hallucination of death. It's a hallucination of pain and suffering and sickness. It has no basis in reality. It has no foundation to stand on. If you were walking through a desert and you were thirsty, you may have a hallucination that we call a mirage of an oasis. And A Course in Miracles is your oasis. You're hallucinating a book now <laughs> in this crazy impossible situation of a world, and you need help to extract from impossibility, to return to inevitability, eternity. So, there are things in the Course that imply work. Jesus uses the word effort. Suppose you were a fish in a river, and the stream and the current is carrying you along, and you're just going downstream, and suddenly, at some point in your life, you realize that the current is taking you into oblivion. You've just been floating with the current of the world. Bigger, better, faster, more, comparison, productivity, striving, success. That's the current of the world and you float in that current, you just keep floating downstream. And in one sense, what Jesus is saying is, that's not where you're going to find the source by floating downstream. You're going to have to go upstream to find it. Like the salmon, when the salmon spawns, the salmon, you ever see the salmon, how they swim? They leap! They're going upstream to spawn, they're leaping! and leaping, and they're powerful little fish, and they've got an important mission, and they're leaping and leaping to go upstream. In one sense, if your mind has become so accustomed to illusions, and so accustomed to the ego's thought system, that it's going to initially take some effort to turn it around. Because you made the ego, and you made the world, and now you become accustomed to the world, and it's become familiar. And now to escape, you're going to have to go the other direction. In A Course in Miracles, there's three lessons, only three lessons of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that nice? We only have to get three. It's not ten, or twenty, or a hundred. Three. Three lessons. To have Give all to all. See how that relates to our lesson? To have, give all to all. That's the first lesson of the Holy Spirit. To have peace, number two, to have peace, teach peace to learn it. We're going to have to teach peace over and over. The attitude of peace in countless situations, countless situations, teach peace over and over. To strengthen it in our mind. 
We're gonna, it's going to take an effort of teaching that peace, we're, because we've become accustomed to a world of conflict and, and war, and we need to teach peace to learn it. And then the final lesson of the Holy Spirit, be vigilant only for God and His Kingdom. Look at that word, vigilant. Do you feel the effort behind vigilance? Do you feel the discipline behind vigilance? Jesus knows we can do this. He did it. He knows it's inevitable for us too. He's just trying to save time and get us moving in the right direction. Three lessons, and the last one is be vigilant for God and His Kingdom. It will seem, initially, when the mind is untrained, it will take an effort. But, what if you, if you can put your effort into escaping from this world, wouldn't you do it? Instead of trying to just go downstream and be successful, learn lots of things, get accolades, respect, degrees, all kinds of adulation and all that stuff that the ego wants, were you just floating down the stream, or will you make the effort to go back upstream, back to the source? That's why, even in this world, when you try to learn a skill, an ability, it takes some effort. Think about it when we were kids, and we were going to ride our bike for the first time. Remember that? It took a little bit of effort. It took courage. We were afraid we would fall. In my case, little David had mom running along the side, holding the seat of the bike behind from where I was pedaling, and the thing was teetering like this, and mom was holding on to the back of the seat to keep the bike up. Eventually, I think she got tired of how a slow learner David was, so she got training wheels. You know, those little things, and you, you got to hop on the bike, and it tilts, and you know, it's like, oh, Mom, <laughs> come back. <laughs> but, you know, it took an effort. It generally took some effort. And, and anybody who's gone through a college degree, anybody who's graduated from high school, or even grade school, or anything for that matter, even in this world to learn skills and abilities, it requires some effort. To forgive, to find forgiveness in your mind, it's going to take some discipline. It's not like you can twinkle your nose or kick your heels together and go, okay, no place like home, three clicks, okay, I did it, I've, I've got the red boots on, is that good? It's not going to work that way, you know, it's going to take some discipline. Jesus says in A Course in Miracles, an untrained mind can accomplish nothing. Hmm, that's good to know from Jesus, like, give it to me straight, an untrained mind can accomplish nothing. He also says, you are much too tolerant of mind wandering. Hmm, put those two together. You start to realize, wow, he's giving me a curriculum to follow with this book, and he's giving me instructions, and they're actually really simple instructions. And there's only two instructions for the workbook. Only two. Only three lessons to learn from the Holy Spirit, and only two instructions. Don't do more than one lesson a day, and as best you can, try not to make exceptions to the lesson as you practice when you move through the day. And we only have one central lesson per day. Just one lesson to focus on, and only two instructions, which are really pretty simple. Don't make any exceptions, don't try to do more than, don't do more than one lesson a day. So you see, this is the master, this is this is actually another, another group of words for Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. If you're going to follow a teacher, it's good to follow the way, the truth, and the life. Because, why? Because he's gone through the keyhole of time and space and he's returned to eternity. I would rather follow a teacher who's accomplished the learning goal than someone who's kind of in an iffy stage. Maybe. <laughs> would you follow certainty or would you follow maybe, if you're going for a learning goal, if you had a teacher to choose? I would go for certainty myself. And so he's telling us, we're going to have to work at this. Not in reality, 
basically, I'll give you a clue that the third lesson of the Holy Spirit, be vigilant only for God and His Kingdom. He tells you what the realization of the final lesson is, so he lays it right out in there. And it's really simple. It's so simple, you go, oh my God, this is it? This is what the whole thing, the final lesson of the Holy Spirit is pointing to. He says, in the recognition, in the realization of the final lesson, you see that having and being are the same. What you have is what you are. Having and being are identical. And you can see how it's in direct opposition to the ego's teachings of this world. What you have is what you possess. What you have are your assets. What you have is what you own. What you have is what's to your name. What you have involves a body. Think of it, I have a body. No you don't. Not really. Yeah, we've been taught that having is different than being. I have a house, I have a child, I have a body, I have a bank account, I have a personality or I have a personality trait. You see that have word is tied into what? Getting. That's how you have. You gotta get, well the getting's good, you gotta get, 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 and you gotta get, get, get for years and years and keep on getting, keep on getting, and then if you keep on getting and getting and getting for years and years and years, then you'll have. Like Gus, wish I had a dollar for every post I've done. Matter of fact, I do, come to think of it, <laughs> for every post. You see, but that's that. But, but Gus was sent by Red, a good friend of Red's, just for that initial lesson of work. Because if, if you're prideful, if you're arrogant, if you're just like our main character there, Jason, he's like, well, even if this doesn't pan out, I can, I can just still live on my trust fund, my mother's trust fund. You know, it's like, there, there's a dependency there. No interest in working, no interest in, in discipline. You know, drives the motorcycle up to the airport <laughs> with the police following him, <laughs> chasing him, hops off and, you know, he said police escort, sort of. <laughs> you know, he just, it's, it's like a throwaway. He, he's like, oh, what, okay, I leave the motorcycle behind. He's not really interested, he doesn't, looking at, at consequences, he's not looking at anything. And so this is a very good first lesson that Red is leaving for his grandson Jason. The gift of work. He sent him down to his buddy Gus down in Texas just to experience, to experience work. Not because that's an end in itself, but because he's going to need what? The discipline of getting up at five in the morning, going out and doing something on a repetitive basis. Taking post of itself doesn't mean anything, but the discipline. We've all had many experiences where we've had discipline opportunities. And the Holy Spirit is saying, good, I can use that. I can use that, what? In your mind training. Most of us aren't living in convents or following rituals like they have in, in a lot of monasteries and Buddhist monasteries and centers, you know, there's lots and lots of ritual. Even if you work in corporate, you know, there's going to be rituals. There's lots of rituals actually in, in corporate. In fact, even if you're flipping burgers at McDonald's, there's going to be some rituals that you're going to have to do. And all of those things will involve discipline, and then the Holy Spirit and Jesus are saying, good, I can use that quality of mind, that discipline, for a goal that's so high it will get you out of an impossible situation. You can train your mind to escape an impossible situation. And wouldn't you want to do it if you could? Wouldn't that be a good 
application of effort, if you could escape time and remember eternity, remember your true home, remember your true source. Now a lot of times, you know, in, in religion, different churches and theology, it's like, here's the beliefs, do this to be a good boy, a good girl, and do that, you'll get, you'll burn in hell. <laughs> so, you know, it's almost like a, a, here's what you do, here's what you don't. Jesus is like more, well, we need your discipline, we need you to put your effort towards forgiveness, towards training your mind to release attack thoughts, release grievances, release judgments, and it will take you into the experience of a pristine mind, of an I am presence, that's prior to time. You will literally escape time by seeing that who you are is before time was. The I amness of your being, and the I amness of what you have as well, because having and being are the same. You have eternity. You are eternity. It's the same thing. But that having doesn't involve possession or ownership. So that's, that's where this is, is moving. So that's, we've just seen the first gift. Michael mentioned there's quite a, there's a number of gifts. How many total? Ten gifts. Whew! Just starting off with number one, to get him moving in the right direction. Like, welcome the discipline. Welcome, embrace the idea of discipline. Because, why? Because the Holy Spirit can use it. And all of us know that in our professions, in our relationships, we've developed some discipline. We, we can't say that we haven't. That's definitely a, a skill, a, a characteristic that the Holy Spirit can use. Okay. I just gave you the song, it's fantastic. Crazy? You're gonna have to serve somebody. Oh, you're going to have to serve somebody. Bob Dylan. <laughs> it may be the devil, or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. <laughs> Bob Dylan, hey, just won, just got the Nobel Prize, Nobel Peace Prize. And that was his song, we know, his contribution to the plan of awakening. You may, you're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil, it may be the Lord. Yes? So you were saying that you need to talk to these young people who want to drop out of school. So a good reason to stay in school is because you're developing that discipline and you're learning things that the Holy Spirit can then use to help you get home. Yes, that's an aspect. You might say that it all depends on the purpose. It, uh, some of the ones that I meet are kind of like indigo or crystal children, and even indigo children and even crystal children, if they don't have that discipline, they may know in their hearts that there's something beyond this world. They may know in their hearts that the society is wacko, <laughs> and that trying to gain all these skills and earn lots of money and, and be successful as a world judge judges that it's not really where it's at. But if they haven't developed that sense of discipline, they, you know, they don't really have that, they're still going to need that for the, the mind training. So it actually depends more on, on actually where the mind is at, too. Uh, because that's important as well. That if, if you had a child, I think a a good uh, example of, um, of something that may be a little counter to what we're talking about here is there's, there's a new movie that came out, I believe this year, and I've seen it, and it's very good. Uh, Mel was talking about Risen. There's also one called Young Messiah, where it's like a 12-year-old 12, 12 Jesus. And it follows this 12-year-old, and he's working miracles at 12. <laughs> He's like really come into this world aligned with the Father's will in many ways. So he's working miracles at 12 and he, he's interested in talking to the rabbis, but he's doing more teaching. Uh, he's teaching the rabbis already at 12. He's, he's, not, he's your rare, he's like your Eckhart Tolle back then. You know, he's already had his park bench experience and he's 12 and he's already well into miracles. So, in that sense we could say, he's not so in need of, of the education, of learning anything, and he's not so in need of developing 
so much to discipline, maybe some. He still has a family life, he still got Mary and Joseph, and from the Arantia book we know he had brothers and sisters, and there was a lot of lessons that happened that were still part of his childhood. So he's still really working towards that atonement, where he could say, before Abraham was, I am, the, the final lesson, that having and being are the same. But I think you've made a good point that for a lot of uh, children, like this woman who just wrote to me, whose nine-year-old wants to quit, um, she's, I think, intuitively aware that there's some avoidance going on, that this is a child who was homeschooled until she was, she was seven, and now there's a fear of interacting with children, and she's aware of that fear. So I did tell her, you need to talk directly with her, with your child, about these things. Because you're all in this together, we're all in this together. You don't have to, to feel all the responsibility is on you, but you, if you intuitively feel that there's some fear and avoidance going on, and as you're bringing up, there are benefits. Uh, this classroom can be used as a very good uh, backdrop for discipline, for disciplining the mind. And that would be another, I didn't mention that aspect, but that would be another aspect of mind training. Like use what's given to you to, to advance. Yeah, mm -hmm. and even learning skills like, you know, for me, business writing. So yeah. now I can write, you know, pretty well. And so the Holy Spirit can use that. Yes. Some mm -hmm. purpose. But if I had never learned that, then it's not there to be used. So yeah, I felt that way too. I, I went through, I went through kindergarten, I went through grade school, I went through junior high, I went through high school, and then I, I went through the University of Cincinnati for 10 years full-time. So I went through 10 years of full-time university. And there were lots of skills, not only skills that I developed during those 10 years full-time of university, but meeting people from all over the world. It was a very eclectic population, so I had friends that were from India and from different parts of the world and the United States. and. So I, can, I feel it was the same way, I felt like I was developing a vocabulary, I was developing disciplines, work skills, opening my mind, learning to listen to all these different opinions and stereotypes, and thinking, I don't like the way that people are stereotyping my friends. You know, friends from India, friends from different places. I, 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 I started to say, I don't like the stereotypical thinking. I even took such a range of everything. I, I was in uh, engineering to start off with. I was in urban planning for five years, but it was eclectic. So I was in this conservatory of music. I was in the College of Design, Art, Architecture and Planning. I was, I took uh, sociology, anthropology. I was all over the place taking a little bit of everything and paying close attention and developing skills. And so when Jesus Finally, after, it wasn't like he took me right out of university, because I, I had student loans, debt. So Jesus says, we got to work on that first. Got to pay off your debts, and I'll do even more mind training with you while, while you're paying them off. Yeah, I'll, I'll help free your mind through all that too. And then, after a few years of, uh, like, knocking all the chips off the shoulder, kicking the pride out of me, <laughs> power washing the pride out of me, you know, like with a fire hose, uh, after that, and paying off the debts as a byproduct <laughs> through all of that, then he said, now you're mine, and I will use you in ways that you can't even imagine. Don't ask what the future holds. You're mine. I'm your boss now. I will give you the instructions moment by moment, and you, we'll do fine. But this is for the whole planet now. This is this is the salvation of the world that we're working on. This isn't for a corporation or working for a company. This You're working for me. And that was pretty intense too, because I, I had still had all these beliefs about how I would be provided for, and pride about work ethic. I can't just receive things from people I've never met. Oh yes you can, he said, that's me, giving them to you through the people. You have to be very humble. So, but But right here we're just, this is such a great teaching movie because we're seeing Jason is very proud. He almost didn't even go for it. You know, he almost said, I'll get back at this guy for, 
for what he's done to me, I'll ignore him. And that's what the ego would have us do. When, even when help is offered us, we get an olive branch, we get, we get a beautiful gift from heaven saying, here's your way out, just grab a hold somewhere on this branch and I'll pull you out of the, the water. Then we still have that choice, do we take it or do we swat it away and say, ah. I mean, I know there's sometimes that t teenagers have said, told their parents, why did you bring me to this world? You know, how could you do that? <laughs> and maybe the parent didn't have the answer, which is, can be frustrating. Like, well, yes, this world is an impossible situation, but I seem to be here too. <laughs> so we're both in this together. <laughs> You're forgetting, I seem to be here too. <laughs> we both need to help each other get out, instead of, I'm not responsible for bringing you here. And you're not responsible for serving me, but we need help, <laughs> major help here, to get out of an impossible situation. Now that would be an answer, that would be an actual answer, but most of the times the parents want to help, but they don't, they aren't aware of the escape hatch, uh, or that there even is an escape hatch, so, so they don't have an answer. Okay, we'll move forward and see what happens, he's just got back from his first gift, nine more to go! Okay, <laughs> wow, <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's so great to see a movie where you see so many life lessons compressed in one viewing, you can see, see it. But it's just coming out of this personal sense of self and just getting into this vast sense of all the love and gratitude and the gift of of our creation coming back into that. So, okay, we'll open it up. Anybody have anything to share from watching that movie that came to you? We've got Jeffrey standing by here. Anybody has anything to share? I'm feeling extremely grateful because I feel like I've got such an incredible amount out of this gathering in 24 hours. I just can't quite believe it. And if, if I had to leave right now, I would feel like I've got full value out of this week. So thank you to everybody. Oh, I really enjoyed like that uh, the gift of a perfect day and that was so beautiful like that's what I can give to myself every day and the way she says in the end like this is the end of that perfect day and today is I feel the end of that perfect day <laughs> right now yeah. thank you for giving us so much perfection thank you Many of, of the gifts in that, you know, finding a hundred dollars in the bottom of my suitcase after he goes, and after I go on the bus, and, and uh, just being there um, when I need somebody, and that. But um, yeah, I feel as I want to give him a copy of that movie. Thank you. <coughs> the first time I saw Jason smile in the whole film that I remember it was probably after he completed three or four gifts. I can't remember which one it was, it might have been a gift of giving. And his whole face lit up, so to me it was the first time he looked happy experience true happiness and he started learning these gifts or giving these gifts yeah, it's beautiful that the more he went along the, the
the less he seemed to know and the less he could figure out, you could feel the, the underlying trust growing and the surrender growing. And then the reflections coming back when the little girl said, yes, guys are clueless. You know, <laughs> even the reflections coming everywhere of, of that sense of not knowing. And I guess since the time of Jesus, there's been this word, there's a word in Christianity called salvation. And uh, there's been many meanings given to that word salvation, many different connotations, and, uh, and it, salvation comes from salvage, salvage, you know, when you salvage something, you save it, uh, so it's like saved, you know, and all this stuff about being a Christian and being saved and professing the name of Jesus, it's not that. It's not some kind of a belief in a man that lived 2,000 years ago, or belief in a story. Whether you believe in the story or not, doesn't matter. Remember, all of history is generated from the ego anyway. So whether you believe that he rose from the dead or not, no, it's not a theology. It's not a theology. It's not about being saved as a person. In A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, only the mind needs salvation. Only the mind needs to be salvaged, he says. And it's only salvaged through peace. So it's very important that he lays it out. You don't need to save the whales, you don't need to save the dolphins, you don't need to save Mother Earth, you don't need to save the planet, you don't need to save your family, you don't need to save people, go around and save people, convince them that they need to be saved. You don't need any of that. Nothing needs to be saved except the mind, Jesus says. The mind needs salvation. This mind that has believed in separation needs salvation, needs to be salvaged. <laughs> you need to salvage that mind. And it's only salvaged, he gives us the, the how, only through peace. Not through anything else, not through saving souls, not through, you know, doing something on earth, not through making the world a better place, not through self-improvement, not through making yourself a better person. <coughs> Nothing but peace. Peace is the means. And the salvaging of the mind is the only thing that is there. And if you really get into the Course, you go deeper and deeper and deeper, he's got a section called, I need do nothing. <coughs> this salvation of the mind is, is through peace, but it's not through doing. There will be never a doing. Nothing that ever is done is needed to accomplish it. No behavior is needed. It's in the mind. It's a, it's a shift of purpose in the mind, and it's the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest little tweak that you'll ever discover, because it's not a big tweak. There's one point where Jesus says, prepare ye now for the undoing of what never was. Wow, it can't be difficult if it never was. It can't really be difficult if it never was. And it can't really need a lot of preparation if it's that tiny of a tweak, if it's coming back to just accept. And so he does, late in his text, he finally comes out and he, he tells us what salvation is. I do not know the thing I am, what I'm doing, where I'm going, or how to look upon myself or the world. That is salvation. Just be 100% clueless about this world. Because the Holy Spirit will give this world a new meaning. If you give him the crack of complete cluelessness. As soon as you think you know anything at all about this world, you block salvation from awareness. 
As soon as you believe you know anything at all about this world, you have a past association and you've written a false meaning on the screen of the world, on the script of the world. So, that is, just think of it, it's miraculous, it's amazing, it's grace. It's truly the gift of grace, of, of not knowing anything about anything. And the only way you can come into that is through trust. Trust would settle every problem now. To pray, to be open, to say, show me, to say, show me, show me, show me, show me. If you go through the workbook lessons, you know, you start off with number one and when you get down to 360, he's got the same repeating lesson for the final five lessons in the workbook. This holy instant would I give to you. Be you in charge. If the, the presence, the essence of that, finally, when you get to the final five lessons, is a, our lessons in surrender. He says this course is a beginning and not an end. The whole point of the course is just to put you in touch with the internal teacher. And he says, and the Holy Spirit will direct all subsequent lessons. You, you just get aligned, that's all it is, is just to come aligned. Just to feel that love, feel that connection. To feel and to know in your heart that it's within you, that you are inner directed and you don't need to rely on people, places, things, theology. In fact, it's so beautiful in the in Lesson 189, Jesus says, simply do this, be still, lay aside all thoughts of what you are, what God is, hold on to nothing. Do not bring with you one thought the past has taught, nor one belief you've ever learned before from anything. Forget this world, forget this course, <coughs> and come with holy empty hands unto your God. I remember when I first read that paragraph, my heart chords were just going so strong. It's like, Jesus is like, pay attention, <laughs> I'm giving it to you straight, you know. Forget this world. We talked about that earlier, forget this world. Not in kind of a denial way, or not in kind of a, a way of trying to push something away, but just because you can. You, you forgot God, you're capable of forgetting this world. <laughs> and you're capable of surrendering and coming back. And, uh, yeah, I have to agree, this has been a perfect day. Like Pam was saying, this has just been a perfect day. It's, it's, it's there for us to feel the perfection of, like, every nuance. Everything that seems to occur is just absolutely in divine order, and always has been. And it's only been the ego that is is feeling something is wrong, something's gone wrong, and you need to add a little bit to the script or take a little bit away. Every day that's all the ego is trying to do. Things would be better if they would be just a little different. Which is what? Denying perfection. It's denying that all things work together for good, that let all things be exactly as they are. That is available, that, that state of mind is available. But it's let all things be exactly as they are. Or you remember the famous Beatles song, let it be. Speaking words of wisdom, let it be. We don't have to change the world, we can't improve the world. There is no hope of a better world, it's just a, a different perception of the world. And it's like, Jesus is just like saying, come off the timeline. It's so beautiful when you're not on the timeline. And it, it just seems so difficult when, when we're identified as being on the timeline. And 
with regrets of the past and worries and concerns of the future. Life's too precious, this moment is too precious to be drawn into that. And, and Jesus does get very metaphysical. Sometimes people will say, well, I would be back home in, in God if it weren't for this body. This body. <laughs> I put so much care and attention in this body. If I wasn't thinking about this body <laughs> and working in on behalf of the body, and and Jesus is saying, the body is a means and not an end. It's just a means that the Holy Spirit can use. It's not an end. Don't, don't hold it in your mind as an end, as something important in and of itself. Even says it doesn't even exist in and of itself. Nothing in this world exists in and of itself. It's all part of a holistic mind experience. One point Jesus says, at no single instant does the body exist at all. It is always remembered or anticipated. But at no single instant does it exist at all. And you can think about all the time and effort that goes into the body, the survival, the comforts, the conveniences, the preparation of the future, future goals, future body goals. All of that seems reasonable within the ego's perception, but it's not really reasonable in the ultimate perception of uh, the world, of the like simultaneous perception. So, so it just takes a faith to let go of the wheel of karma, to let go of the, the hamster wheel of busyness, of, of the mind spinning around and around and around. And, and we all have had those moments, those glimmers. I remember many, many years ago when I was sitting there watching the movie Gandhi. And Gandhi was over in South Africa and uh, he was taking a walk with an, an American uh, journalist named Walker, and they were walking along and uh, the journalist was looking around at the ashram that was being built. I actually went to South Africa and went to the place where this ashram was in South Africa a couple of years ago, I think two or three years ago, and, and the American journalist said to Gandhi, Mr. Gandhi, you're quite an ambitious fellow. And Gandhi's reply was, I hope not. I hope not. And I remember as I was watching that many, many years ago, my heart just <gasps> kind of leaped with that, I hope not. That we've bought a, a bill of goods even to be ambitious ego motive. Ambition. Ambition. Wow. That is a, a sense of self-deception on, on the grandest scale, instead of being who we are and have always been to, to buy into this thing called ambition, that it'll be better. Jesus says at one point, he's got a section called the immediacy of salvation. He said, future loss is not your fear. Future loss is not your fear. Your real dread is present joining. Wow. When we feel uncomfortable as human beings, if there seems to be a pause or a dead space, when you're with somebody and there's this awkward feeling or this uncomfortable feeling where you want to look away, you don't want to keep gazing in the eyes, you don't want to hold a glance, when there's this awkwardness that comes with the human condition, it's a fear of love. It's 
facing that fear of love. It's a fear of dropping the mask. Persona, in the Latin, is mask. Personality comes from persona. And the meaning in Latin of persona is mask. Holding a mask up. Holding a mask is how we defend against our fear of love. If the mask would drop, we think, what then? I would be naked, I would be exposed. Who would I be without this mask? Who would I be without these defense mechanisms? Who would I be without protectionism? That is really where these expression sessions tomorrow that we'll go into, that's what we're doing is, is dropping the mask. You can speak whatever the thoughts are, there's no penalty. It's just the hiding of the thoughts maintains the mask. Can I be transparent? Can I just speak from the heart? Can I just say, this is what I'm feeling now, these are my thoughts, don't hold it against me. I want to let them go. I'm just going to let them come and roll off my tongue, but they're not me. Don't hold it against me. This, this habit of judging is not who I am. And this judgment has not changed reality. I just need to convince myself, be convinced, that I'm not guilty. Will you join me in that? You know, that's really the, what we're all about. We're asking for a joining in innocence. And the ego is so frightened. It's frightened of love. It's frightened of God. It is fear. And yet, in the ultimate sense, it can't be our own fear. We must, when we feel afraid, we must be feeling the ego's feelings. Our spirit is not afraid. Perfect love casts out fear. Our spirit is not afraid, but if we're feeling fearful, we're just feeling the imposter's feelings. What a glorious realization. I cannot be afraid. Who I am cannot be afraid. That's the, the release. Right through my childhood and teens and halfway through uni, I was incredibly shy. And then there was this moment that just popped into my head when you were speaking, when I was about 19 or 20, and I was saying goodbye to my parents to drive back to uni in another city. And I never have recalled them saying prior to that time ever telling me that they loved me. I knew they did but I'd never heard the words, they're not very affectionate, they never hugged or anything. And I just had this impulse, I jumped out of the car and I jumped up and I told my mum, who's very stoic, and I, I just said, I love you, and I gave her a big hug and I said the same to my dad. And my dad said it back and I was blown away, but it was almost like I had an instant of apprehension or fear, but I just let it go. Like it came through something else, I dropped the mask and I think that was a bit of a turning point because from that day forward I, you know, I could look at strangers in the eye when I walked past them instead of hiding my head away and I could smile at strangers and things. And in the early years, if a stranger didn't engage my eye contact or looked away or didn't smile back, or, you know, they kind of glance at you when you're walking past, I used to be upset, and, you know, like, or not offended, but just take it as not as a, like a personal affront or something or like a rejection I felt rejected and then I was contemplating it and I realized that's just their fear they're afraid to let that mask down like I remembered that moment happening with my parents on the driveway that day and so ever since then I just continue smiling and maintaining our eye contact and if they look away it doesn't affect me at all I just feel compassion for them I guess and so I remember what it felt like, very separate. Yeah, so I was yeah. just recalling that. Oh. I'm glad you share that, because I think of all the movies I've watched in my life where the, the whole theme is this fear to say I love you. And uh, it's just, 
this it's the, the ego that has this fear of, of those words because there's some kind of expectation that's tied in. Almost like, don't say it because it's, it'll cost you too much. <laughs> don't say it, there's too many expectations <laughs> that come with those words. You're going to have to pay for that. If you, it's not as if there's a cost to expressing the truth. What a crazy, crazy idea that it costs something to say from your heart, I love you, when that's who we are, that's the core of our being, that's, we simply can't do anything else except love, because we were created as love, and yet the human condition is this awkwardness around that. I have to say that's one of the greatest things in working with A Course in Miracles for all these years, 30 years since I picked it up. I think the best part is the I love you's, is going through a day or weeks or months or whatever and having that I love you come out so much. I have, over the years it's come out in so many ways. Uh, you, you can put it as a signature on your email. You can, I even put that as a, like, you know, your voicemail, your phone. <laughs> I would, it came out so naturally where it said, record at the beep, you know, da 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 da, -da I love you, you know, it's like, even as a, as a answer, a, a part of your answer and your answering machine, you can, it starts to come out naturally, so naturally. That's the best experience when you start to feel it and it feels so natural, more natural than breathing more natural than breathing, when it doesn't have any overtones or associations with it, when it comes off so freely, just bursting out of your heart and there's no cost to it. You know, there's no, nothing, no price to pay. No sense of somebody saying, back it up. <laughs> no sense of, 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 of a force or an entity or anything saying, prove it. It's, it's who we are and, and we can allow it to be more and more and more natural. There was a movie, uh, some of you remember, with Ally McGraw and uh, uh, Ryan O'Neill called Love Story. And there's an interesting line from that movie, I don't know if you ever remember that, but Love is never having to say you're sorry. Love is beyond apologies. Because apologies still acknowledge something has gone wrong. And the whole point of no worries, <laughs> back to my no worries talk, but the whole point of no worries, the reason for no worries is because of innocence. That no worries is founded on innocence, founded on original innocence. No worries comes from this awareness that there is no original sin. Could never have been an original sin. If there's sin, how can you not worry? Because <laughs> sin is, you know, in the Aramaic, sin was missing the mark. It's an archery term. But if we have a perfect day, that means, whoosh, we hit the mark. We hit the bullseye. Yeah. I love you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's a celebration. I love my travels down to Mexico and South America. Fiesta, there's a David, fiesta, fiesta. I don't know the, the meaning, but as Jeffrey knows, there was that time where they came to me and they said, Absolutamente spectacular! I don't even need to know what that means in <laughs> Spanish, because Absolutamente spectacular! It, it comes through. I know what spectacular means. And mente is mind. And absolute. <laughs> you can put these together. Absolute mente spectacular. The mind is pristine. The mind is undisturbed. The mind is whole. The mind is complete. The mind of God. 
the mind of Christ. You know, that's what we're celebrating. There's much to celebrate. There's much. And that's just coming into an acceptance. The acceptance of that. That's the acceptance of no worries. The Course talks about mighty companions, down here it's the mighty mates. Rejoice in the mighty mates. Every day rejoice in the mighty mates. Yeah. Glee, joy, happiness, without end. Yeah. Whew. Day one. <laughs> yeah, that's what we're here for. Um, Lou Reed had a song called The Perfect Day, and uh, yeah, I'm not going to sing it, <laughs> but it says, um, just a perfect day, I want to spend it with you, oh such a perfect day. Oh, I can't remember it, but yeah, it's just beautiful, if you ever hear it, and these, um, yeah, and that reminds me of today, such a perfect day. And I never thought I would have a perfect day, but I have. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Ah, oh, that's beautiful, that's beautiful. Yeah, it's a celebration. Yeah. And our choir used to love singing. Um, well, I particularly loved singing the bit where they're shaking hands, saying, "How do you do?" They're really saying, "I love you." Yeah. I just love that line. Yeah. <laughs> I see friends shaking hands, say, "How do you do?" They're really saying. I love you. <laughs> yeah, we love that song. <laughs> Our resident singer has the mic. <laughs> just a little quip. I remember. I just. Years ago, I don't know, 15 or more years ago, I went through a little bit of a stage, just different things I've done, and at one point I would answer the telephone and I would, and I would say, hello, beautiful person. <laughs> and interesting, that was usually okay, but one day there was this really pregnant pause and I thought, and it was Sally's great, um, great aunt, stoic old great aunt, and then she just said, that's ridiculous. <laughs> I said, oh. And I said, oh, okay. And then she said, what if it was Paul Keating? That's the, that's the point of this expression session, exposing, exposing the awkwardness. That's what we could call expression sessions. Just exposing the awkwardness. Very healing. Very healing. I just loved going around different countries and seeing the, all this exposing the awkwardness. And then it's because everyone gets more, but they're so light and playful and happy. It's like the feeling like, oh, it's, Nothing's gone wrong. These thoughts haven't changed anything. You know? But the hiding of the thoughts is, takes a toll on awareness. Truth is unchanged, but it takes a toll on awareness, on our awareness. It puts, clouds our, our vision, clouds our minds. So that's really the, the one thing that I've really got from the Course is don't, 
There's just no need to hide and protect anything. Like that moment when you said I love you to your, your parents. It's just You went right past that hesitation, right past that little bit of doubt. Yeah, like, no, it's so important, and the I love you came out, and then your dad, yeah, even said it right back. That was beautiful, an instant, like a reflection. Sorry is associated with guilt. If we do something inadvertently that hurts someone or damages something or upsets someone, even if we only find out about it later, I still feel like I should apologise. Yeah, it's uh, one thing I always liked about Jesus, because I would ask him about these things, and and I would say, what if, what if someone else is offended? or seems to be, or I've been offended, and he said, you have to pluck the offense from your mind. It's, it still comes back to the mind. You can't even perceive it unless you believe it. And he's like, pluck, like, I like that word, pluck the offense. That, that it's, it is a, a full-time job, so to speak, minding the mind. I know when I would go on this, the tubes over there in, in London, there'd always be this recorded voice in the tubes, mind the gap, mind the gap. And Jesus talks about the gap, <laughs> actually, in the Course, he talks about everything. He covers, my gosh, he covers the gap. <laughs> he says, there's a, there's a tiny gap, and I'm like, oh my God. All this, mind the gap, mind the gap. Jesus is like, yeah, yeah. You've, you've got to overlook the gap. You seem to have a gap between you and your brother, between you and your sister, that makes you separate people. And he's saying, that gap is not there. He even has that I need do nothing section where he, he talks about all these pathways to God, fighting against sin and, uh, and meditation and contemplation, and he rattles off all these traditional pathways when people approach God. And he says, these approaches will work because of their purpose, but they are tedious and time-consuming. <laughs> oh, the Master says, meditation is tedious and time-consuming. <laughs> Contemplation, you know, your way will be different. <laughs> okay, I'm all ears. <laughs> he says, your way will be different. And a way, the way is given you in which you can escape time. You can save countless years. There's a way of quick, direct access back to eternity. Okay, I'm all ears. What is it? What is, what is my way? A holy relationship is given you as a means of awakening. It's, your way will be different. A holy relationship. Now you've really got my attention. What is that? <laughs> Please tell me, what is this fast escape hatch into self-realization? He says, you and your brother are together. That's his way of saying, it's all one mind. It's always been one mind. It's always been pure oneness. You and your brother are together. You should focus on, I need to do nothing. You can, you can, it seems to the ego the most ridiculous, crazy thing. I need to do nothing, but, but ultimately it's coming in to that place of acceptance, of just absolute oneness, absolute connection. And then actually practicing with relationship, like starting to see brothers, sisters as mirrors. So if there's something that I find annoying, something irritating, something disagreeable, wow, you can tell it's going to be a fast track. If if he's going after annoyances, irritations, all those things, and saying, these are not tiny things. These are the gap. These are the gap that is not there. You must expose this. You must first acknowledge this. And much of the Course is about exposure, but then actually when you really look at the Course, what he's saying is the, the exposure <coughs> is just the beginning, 
that actually forgiveness is joining with the Holy Spirit and overlooking the error entirely. Exposure is, is not forgiveness, it's just an aspect that leads us into joining with the Holy Spirit and overlooking the error entirely. In fact, there's one pamphlet where he emphasizes, he ital when Jesus italicizes words, it's like, oh my God, he's italicizing some words. I remember the first time I saw this in one of the pamphlets, and I went, oh my God, he's italicized four words, and I thought, these are really important. You know what the four words were that Jesus was italicizing? Do not see error. Do not see error. You, you have to join with the Holy Spirit to reach that state of mind that overlooks the error entirely. It wouldn't matter whether it's Adolf Hitler, it wouldn't matter whether it was Mussolini, Osama bin Laden, all the ones they talk about, the, these what so-called terrorists, or your own government, <laughs> whatever, do not see error. What is he saying but acknowledge divine innocence, acknowledge the innocence that is real, that is true. And what better way than to practice with relationships, instead of seeing them as traps, or as things that are holding you back, things that are blocking you from the light, you know, which is the ego's use of seeing them as, as blocks. Oh, I'd be so happy if it weren't for this one and this one and that one and that one, to go that extra step that you you go more than minding the gap, you <laughs> transcend the gap. <laughs> Imagine hearing that recording over and over, transcend the gap. alive. <laughs> yeah. Well, we will come tomorrow with the expression sessions in the morning, a golden opportunity for, I think is it about an hour? Yeah, nine to ten tomorrow. Very precious. You can come and bring it. <laughs> bring it to the expression session, knowing that you're doing it for the whole universe. That you're not going to just take the awkwardness, the feeling of awkwardness, and just stuff it. This is bring it, <laughs> instead of stuff it. Yeah. And it's precious, it really is. Feel the release of that. Thank you, thank you for this night, uh, sharing this movie. Yeah, it's precious. <laughs>